So the Fed has to look and say, look, we cut rates and we we jam up the stock market another 10 or 15 percent and home prices take off. If I'm right and there's a propensity to spend, there's going to be a lot of people buying new cars and there's going to be a lot of people buying stuff and taking Italy trips and prices are going to go up even more. And then for the bottom 50 percent that don't own assets, that only have debt and see and see more inflation, they lose. So that's I and I believe Jay Powell through his public pronouncements understands what I just said perfectly well. And that's what's holding him back right now, that if you cut rates and you allow all the wealth managers in the world to scream at everybody, you got to get that seven trillion dollars out of money market funds and put it into something else. And we should jam everything higher and we produce more inflation. What have we done for the bottom 50 percent? We've made it worse for them. And that's the fear that you would have to have. So that's why I think he's going to be more deliberate about these rate cuts than people think and why he's waiting to see if there is a soft landing or if there is a last mile to 2% inflation. And I just tweeted out today, there is no last mile to 2% inflation. It bottomed to three, eight months ago, the inflate the over-year CPI inflation rate. And if it stays here, he's not going to cut. On this episode of the What the Finance podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming out back Jim Bianco. Uh, so Jim is the president uh, and macro strategist at Bianco Research. So Jim, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. No problem. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, we spoke sort of close to six months ago uh, when everything in the bond market was seems like it was collapsing. The long at long end uh, sort of had quite a few uh, massive downwards days but uh we sort of recovered since then and we've had a bit of a bull run and i guess you could say our bonds have gone up as well uh but i guess from your perspective if you look at the next you know completely changing the tone but if you look at the next six to 12 months uh where do you see the economy and, and markets moving there so i still think that the fundamental story which i was talking about six months ago is going to continue as we go forward the economy the u.s economy is growing at its potential or its trend, if not a little bit more. It has been for six quarters, and it looks like it's doing exactly that again in the first quarter. Inflation is now looking like it might have bottomed uh, back last summer at around 3%. I'm using year-over-year CPI. Um, And we've gone now eight months without making a new low. And this whole concept that we're in this last mile of inflation doesn't really look like it's panning out just yet. Um, core inflation will probably continue to head lower, but that's at a much higher level. That's at 3.8%. So it might drift down towards 3%, but I don't think it's going to go any further than that. What all this leads up to is what we all really care about, right? What's the economy doing? What's inflation doing? Yada, yada, yada. yada. What I really want to know is when's the Fed's going to cut rates? And the answer is Jay Powell's ready to cut rates. But he needs the data to confirm that it's time to cut rates. He needs the data to weaken a little bit. And it's not. It's staying strong. And the inflation numbers are staying sticky at around 3%. And 3% is not 2%. That is a big difference between 3 and 2 when it comes to inflation. And I've argued when it comes to the Fed, they're just going to keep pushing it off into the future. It's not going to be the March meeting. It's not going to be the May meeting, at least if you look at the market pricing. All right, it's going to be the June meeting. And let's see in 60 days whether or not it's still the June meeting. And what, what do you think it would have to get to? Do you, could you see if it, let's say, you know, CPI remains quite stable over the coming uh, months? Could you see them cutting then? Or do you think it would have to be a bit of a drop? No, I think it has to go lower. <clears throat> I think that the Fed has to start thinking about this idea. See, they start from a premise that the neutral funds rate is 2.5%. How do they arrive at that? Well, they think that the long-run inflation rate is 2. And then they think that the neutral funds rate should be somewhere at around half a percent above that. Well, if the long-run inflation rate is 3, then we're already talking about, you know, a 4.5% funds rate, uh, 4.5% funds rate, or I'm sorry, 3.5% funds rate in order to get neutral. But then that 50 basis points, if it's three, that's probably closer to 100. So in other words, what I'm trying to argue, and this has been an argument in economic circles, is two and a half is not neutral. 
might be near something like 4%. Now, the Fed at five to five and a quarter might be tight, but not nearly as tight as they thought, which is why the economy seems to be able to handle this level of interest rates. It's shrugging those rates off. <laughs> Add to that that the yield curve is still inverted and has been for nearly two years now. So if the funds rate is neutral at around four and five and a quarter to five and a half is a, is a restrictive funds rate, market rates aren't that restrictive because they're near 4%. We're at around 415 as we're recording on the 10-year note. So we're not that far away from it. And that's one of the biggest, I think, debates within the economic community and at the Fed. How much are we really hurting the economy with these interest rates? And my answer is not at all. And I think more and more people are coming to not at all. We're hurting the economy. Okay, but we have an inflation, uh, an unemployment rate under 4%. We have GDP growing at trend. We've got new all-time highs in the stock market and sticky inflation at three. Well, if these rates aren't hurting, why do we need to cut them? And I think that that's the narrative that we're going to hear more and more, that there's not going to be a rate cut. So put me in the camp that the rate cut might be at the end of the year, only if the data starts to weaken by then. Now, it hasn't been for the last several months, and I don't think it will. But, you know, let's see what happens, you know, through the summer and whether or not the data does weaken. Yeah, it's interesting. But then I, I guess what impact does uh, liquidity have on the Fed's actions? Because I think there's a lot of people talking about uh, reverse repo is sort of running out of ammunition. Uh, end of last year, but after we spoke, there was talk about, uh, you know, how would the Treasury sort of fund their deficit? And they uh, sort of brought the funding a bit f forward on the curve. So, yeah, do you think there's a risk that uh, liquidity could be the issue similar to what we saw in 2018? Sure. Um, you know, people are very worried about the liquidity issue. The reverse repo facility is starting to run out. Now, just for everybody to understand, the simple way to think about this is there is a pile of money at the New York Fed in the reverse repo facility, which is not part of the financial system. It's separate. It's over at the, it's over at the Fed. As the reverse repo facility falls, that's not money disappearing. That's money being pushed back into the financial system. So it acts as a form of liquidity. And that liquidity has been offsetting quantitative tightening. So even though the Fed has been engaged in quantitative tightening, it's been canceled by this fall in the uh, RRP, the reverse repo facility, as more and more money is being pushed out of the Fed. Remember, where does that money come from? It comes from money market funds. Money market funds can elect to engage in a repo transaction with the Federal Reserve for interest. But lately, what money market funds are starting to do now, <clears throat> because they think interest rates are going to get cut, is they've been buying long-term treasury bills, like six and nine-month treasury bills, to lock in these rates. So when rates do get cut, they don't immediately see their yields fall. That's why the RRP has been falling. The concern is that when the RRP is done falling, we're left with, if you will, pure QT. And that is removing money from the financial system then. And that there's a concern that that might create a liquidity problem. Okay, that is a concern, but there's no evidence that it will. And if we have a strong economy and sticky inflation and the Fed were to react because something might happen, the fear that they have is they could create even more of a speculative frenzy in financial markets and even more inflation as we go forward. So the RRP is definitely something to keep in mind, but I think it's really all just a theoretical bet. Well, what happens when it ends? What does it mean for QT? We understand what it means, but markets don't seem to be that bothered by it. They know it's coming and they're not really reacting to it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I know I heard you in a recent interview talking about, I guess, the election and how that almost... Uh provides power with with less options so it's either he has to as you said you mentioned there sort of may june he'll have to cut there probably start cutting at the latest otherwise you have to wait till after the election <clears throat> yeah i've been call i've been calling it may june or bust is basically what it is it, the history of the fed is that when you get into the summer of an election year through election day and i want to be careful in my words here they don't change policy so whatever the policy was going in the summer, and in this case, it's hold, 
they will continue that policy through election day. If the policy was cut, they would they could cut through the summer. Or if the policy was hike, they can hike through the summer. But they don't change it in the summer. Now, the one caveat is 08 and 2020. If you tell me that the global economy is being shut down, or if you tell me that markets are in full collapse because of housing prices, then all bets are off. It doesn't matter that there's an election. The Fed will, re- will come in. But really what it boils down to is the March meeting, they're probably not going to move. The May meeting, they're probably not going to move, at least as we understand it now. The pricing, the market pricing is about 20% chance the Fed is going to cut rates. So that leaves the, the June meeting. If they don't move in the June meeting, the meeting after that is July 31st. That is between the Republican and the Democrat convention, July 31st. If the Fed decides to change policy at that meeting, they will do what they desperately don't want to do, is insert themselves into the political debate. I believe, like Claudia Salm and some others have argued, the Fed is not partisan, but they are political. And what they mean by that is that they don't sit around the meeting at the Fed and say, Donald Trump says he'll fire um, uh, Jay Powell if he becomes president. So we want Biden to win. So what policy should we do to get Biden to win? They do not do that. They do not do that. They're not partisan. But are they political? Yes. They don't want to insert themselves into the political debate. So by moving in July or September, then you get the candidates talking about them. And that's exactly what they don't want. So I think if they don't pull the trigger by June, then they're going to have to wait until after the election, assuming that the data actually weakens enough to give them that move. So we 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 are closer to an endpoint for the rate cuts in 2024 than we think. We'll have to know by June whether or not they're actually going to happen. Yeah, I find that an interesting point, as you said, it, just trying to <laughs> probably lay low and stay out of the, the limelight as much as they can, because it's an easy target for any of these uh, political parties to, to latch onto. And I might add, it might be an easy target either way, because <clears throat> on the one hand, you could say, well, if they cut rates, the Republicans will scream you're trying to get Biden elected. But on the other hand, if they cut rates and there's weakness, then the Democrats will scream, you waited way too long. We've been yelling at you to cut rates, and now you're going to affect the outcome of the election because you stalled too much with the rate cuts. So they could lose either way. So it's not necessarily that they cut rates, that it's only one party or the other that will get on their case. Most likely, if they cut rates, both of them will get mad at them, and then they wind up losing two times. Yeah, so there's no winning position. So uh, you, you mentioned how strong the economy has been over the past few years, uh, spe- specifically in the US. I guess if you look at other countries, it hasn't been as strong. So w- what have been the main drivers of it? Is it just sort of <coughs> cheap electricity? Is it uh, you know massive investment in sort of these technologies or large de- deficits? Are those the main drivers or are there other things as well? Well, I think the large deficit is one. Um, you know, when the government is spending money like crazy, it's really hard to have a recession or a downturn because they can almost single-handedly add GDP points um, to the economy, especially when they run large deficits. But more to the point, to your question about what's been happening in other countries, let me first of all highlight what's been happening in the U.S. versus other countries. The third quarter GDP and the fourth quarter GDP in the U.S., these are the broad measures, they're as good as any, was 4.9% and 3.3%. These are very strong numbers. These are well above the potential of 2.5% that we think that the economy could grow at. Well, if you look at the UK, they've had two consecutive negative quarters. If you look at Japan, they've had consecutive negative quarters. If you look at the Eurozone or Germany, they've had contraction. Everybody seems to be contracting and the US is running above potential. What's different? Well, as I like to say, every time there's a financial crisis or there is a recession coming out of it, the economy changes. Change is not worse. Change is different. What we're finding is that the change that has happened in this economy is the propensity to spend in the U.S. is much higher. In other words, from 2010 to 2020, the savings rate, to use one metric, was 6% on average during that period, meaning that for every dollar that you got in wages or in in income, you spent 94 cents and you saved Mm -hmm. six. Well, since 2022, the savings rate has been 4%. 
you're spending 96 cents of every dollar, not 94. That's in the U.S. That is not happening in the rest of the world. Consequently, the uh, personal consumption as a percent of GDP has jumped from 67% to 69%. We're spending more money. We're buying, and this isn't just inflation. We're buying more units. We are, we are, you know, we are, uh, have a different attitude. In 2009, 10, and 11, when we were coming out of the Great Recession, and people looked at their brokerage statements, and they saw that they went up, and they looked at the value of their house, and they saw it increased, say, on a Zillow estimate or something, they felt good. They needed to make sure that their savings was adequate in case there was a downturn. So what did they do when the stock market rallied? Nothing. They just felt better about things because their, their net worth went up. Well, in 2022, 23, and now into 24, when the stock market goes up or the Zillow estimate of your house increases, what do we do? We spend more money. We go on vacation. We buy more things. And what we're buying more of is goods. Goods and per- goods consumption is up. Services conduct- consumption is about the same. That's the difference between why the rest of the economy is, why the rest of the world is contracting and the U.S. is not. Our change in spending habits came about right after 2020. We spend more money now than we ever. How long are we going to do that? Till the next downturn. And then we'll change again. Um, Now, why are we doing it? Well, that's one for the psychologists and sociologists to kind of figure out. But I might hazard a guess that during the COVID shutdown, the government basically mailed everybody enough money to pay for everything for a year. And so the attitude seems to be, I'm going to live my life. We call it revenge travel or doom spending, and I'm going to enjoy myself. There's a well-known Wall Street economist who was saying, was noting this trend that people are spending more money. And he rhetorically asked the question, what are they going to do when they're 62? And my answer was, Worry about it when they're 61, because if they're 47, they're going to Italy is what they're going to do. And so that spending is what's not only keeping the economy high, but it's keeping a bid for services and for goods, which is why the inflation rate, I think, is sticking at around 3%. And again, you're not seeing that in the rest of the world. So when you look at a lot of the models that suggest that the U.S. should have went in the recession or should have had a soft landing and it's not having any of those, what those models are missing is that extra spending, that propensity to spend. Those models are very accurate for the rest of the world, but they're not failing. They're failing to recognize that there's been a change coming out of 2020 with the U.S. We spend more money right now. Units, we're buying more units. It's not just prices are up. So we have to spend more because prices are up. That's happening too. But on a real or inflation adjusted basis, we are spending more. And I don't blame people. Because, you know, to go back to the question when you're 62, what are you going to do when there's a downturn and you're 61? I'm going to take a slow walk to the mailbox. And I expect the government to send me a big fat check to get me through the other side. Why not? That's exactly what they did the last time. Um, so that's where I think we are with this spending. Again, it this is this cycle. This cycle is more spending and it's going to be stronger growth until this cycle ends. And then we'll change it again and we'll see how it changes. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about it like that because I guess if we look at uh, the average person, they uh, let, let's be let's say they're not really most. Well, it seems like Biden is quite unpopular at the moment, so the average person maybe is struggling. So I guess how how do you sort of interlink those uh, di- dynamics? Well, I think what you need to you know look at is what's different about this economy too is the inflation story. So the so two things can be true at once. The economy is moving along well. Why? Because 94% of all assets are owned by the top 50% of income. The top 10% of income owns half the assets. Then top 50% of income also account for about 80% of the spending in the U.S. So they're seeing new highs in their portfolios. They're seeing their home prices go up. They're getting investment income because there's a yield again in the economy. So you add all of that up and they're doing very well and they're acting and that's keeping GDP moving forward. The bottom half, well, in 2019, you could argue the exact same thing happened, but the difference was the bottom half had very low interest rates 
and they had wage growth above inflation and inflation was under 2%. So they were kind of moving along with the crowd. They weren't getting rich, but they weren't, weren't going backwards. But right now, the bottom half feels like they've gone backwards. They're, you know, wait, you know, cumulative inflation since 2020 is up over 20 to almost 25 percent. Their wages have only been up about 19 percent. So on a real basis, they're falling behind. And while 94 percent of assets are owned by the top 50 percent, the majority of debt is owned by the bottom 50 percent. That's the unfortunate reality. The rich have the assets and the poor have all the debt. And because of that strong growth and the high inflation rates, they are seeing higher interest costs. So one man, one vote. Jeff Bezos might spend more money than 10,000 people in the bottom 50 percent. But when a pollster calls him and asks him who he's going to vote for, he gets one vote. And when he calls somebody from the bottom 50 percent, they get one vote. So you could both have the economy moving along because the top half is benefiting from interest income booming markets. Uh, they can tolerate the inflation levels um, and they're spending GDP is moving forward. Inflation staying sticky. Bottom half can't keep up with inflation, has higher interest costs, and they're t- expressing their displeasure with the president's low approval rating and why he's running behind his incumbent or why the incumbent Biden is running behind the challenger Trump in most of the polls, at least through the time that we're recording. So that's how you can have two things be true at once. And again, the difference is in 2019, you could argue we had the same thing or 2018, but we gave the bottom half 2% or 1.5% inflation and a 2 to 3% raise and virtually nothing on interest rates on all of their borrowing. And that's why they didn't express the displeasure that they're expressing right now. Yeah, okay, no, that, that that makes sense. So uh, I guess another thing as well, as you mentioned there, that the top 10% own quite a lot of the assets. And I, I think there was this thought that when boomers started to retire, they'd actually stem a lot, a lot of their spending. But you could say maybe some of the boomers are the ones who have those assets. And, you know, from, from a lot of the ones I know, they're sort of continuing to spend at the same rate. <laughs> yes, the boomers, the boomers do have the majority of the assets when they retire. But the problem is it's going to be 147 when they retire right now. They won't, you know, they're still running for office. They're still running companies. They're still spending well into their 70s or into their 80s. So the argument that we've always heard is what happens when we have the generational handoff between the boomers and the Gen Xers and then the Gen Xers and the millennials? Um, Will that create disruptions? Yes, but they're not slowing down. Um, You know, they're 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 plowing through right into their 80s like, you know, like it's nobody's business right now. So that's one of the reasons that's also holding up the economy, because the fear was they would retire, their spending would go down to one fourth of what it used to be. Uh, their money would just sit in a money market fund and because they're old and they don't want to take risk. But that's not happening right yet. Now, someday it might happen. But um, as of yet, it isn't. And that's why the economy continues to stay strong. Yeah, it's definitely not not the same as Japan, because I think a lot of people are comparing uh, the US to what happened in Japan and thinking the same would happen, but definitely hasn't yet. <laughs> right. And I would argue to you that the, that that you know the stimulus money from 2020 was a real game changer. Maybe, you know, maybe in Europe that wouldn't be as big a game changer because they're more socialist than the US. Uh, and that's somewhat expected. But in the US, that was a real change of what we've seen in the past. Just to give you one measure, um, you know, in 2008, we did mail stimulus money to everybody. The average check was $25. That's what they got. They used to ridicule Bush that he was sending them 25 bucks. What, you're going to take your family to lunch? And that was basically all you got. Where people got many, many thousands of dollars in 2020. So we went from $25 to many, many thousands of dollars in 2020 whether you're talking about PPP or stimulus checks or extended unemployment or all of the above um, as well. And that, I really think, really weighed on the psyche of a lot of people and that that really changed their attitude. So like I said before, what am I going to do when I'm 62? I'm going to worry about when I'm 61. What happens when things go bad? I'll just take a slow walk to the mailbox and expect a check from the government because the last time things went bad, that's exactly what happened. So I can't fault people for thinking that way. Whereas in 2010 and 2011, it was, 
good. The market's recovering. My net worth is going up. My nest egg to protect me on the next downturn is getting larger. That attitude we don't have anymore. Yeah, it's definitely shift. So, so you know, you've mentioned that you think the economy will continue continue to be hot. Uh, we'll continue to see at least similar I- I inflation to where we are now. Um, will, will it be the con- same trends driving that? Do you think uh, sort of any other uh, tailwinds that will be supporting it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of the other tailwinds that we we've talked about, of course, um, is technology and is AI, um, and that can be a big tailwind, but. That's going to be, I think, a little more disruptive than people point out. First of all, when it comes to technology, um, I'll quote Bob Gordon, Northwestern University, economist emeritus over there. He's written some great books that technology is a net creator, a net creator of jobs. What is AI going to do for us? It's going to create, not only is it going to create tens of millions of new jobs, it is going to create entire industries that didn't exist. Think about what we're doing right now. Before the internet, the podcast industry did not exist. And it created a whole new category of job with with podcasting. Give you one example. The problem with technology is when AI comes in, we can identify the jobs that are going to go away, but we can't identify the jobs it's going to create. We didn't know that, you know, in in 1999 or in 2000, when things were booming that we would have the podcast industry or someone famously asked me, he said, when Steve Jobs held up the iPhone one in 2007, did you immediately say this is going to be the end of the taxi business because Uber will put an app up on there, or this is going to fundamentally change the hotel business because of the Airbnb app? No, you didn't know that, but that's what eventually comes out of it. So when I hear somebody like Brian Moynihan talk about that bank of America, he's the chairman of bank of America is spending more money on AI than anybody and any other banking institution in the world. That's probably true. He's of this opinion. Here's the bank's model. Then we're going to have these couple of AI chips come in and run these AI programs. And I'll be able to get rid of 12,000 middle management people and and increase the margin of the bank. No, Mr. Moynihan, it's going to fundamentally change the way the bank works. It's going to fundamentally change its business model. It might not bear any relation to the business model that starts, that it's running now. And it might fundamentally change your job as chairman of the bank and make you just as obsolete as a bunch of those middle management people. We don't know where it's going to go, but this is the mistake that everybody makes about AI and technology. Oh, here's my business model. I'll just be able to cut some costs and increase margins. No, it fundamentally, it did not. Oh, here's a, here's here's technology with the internet. And if I'm in the newspaper business, well, then I could just sell less newspapers and sell more subscriptions and have a higher margin. It fundamentally changed everything about your business. And that's what AI is going to do for a lot of businesses. So I think we are correct that at the end of the day, AI is going to be a net benefit for all of us. It's going to be a net creator of jobs. But getting from here to there is going to be very disruptive. Yeah, no, that, that, that does make sense. And as you said, it's sort of driving, I feel like, the US economy at the moment and uh, you can, onshoring as well from sort of the shift from China seems to be uh, another major influence uh, that we've seen recently. Yeah, you could actually look at the onshoring thing with China. So as we are talking right now, there is a bill in Congress to basically ban TikTok unless it unless it divests itself of its Chinese ownership. That is a bill that came up three or four years ago and had zero chance of passing. And now it has every chance of passing. It probably will pass. Both the Democrats and the Republicans are going to vote for it because in our highly partisan world, there is one thing that Democrats and Republicans are unified on, And that is their distrust of China. And that is their ability or willingness to hold hands together and either punish China or make China pay. And so, yeah, that whole deglobalization onshoring thing is very real because of that distrust that both Democrats and Republicans have of China. It is very difficult to walk into um, somewhere in Washington, D.C., 
and find defenders of China on either side of the aisle. She said it's scary to think that it's the only thing that's uh, bipartisan. Yeah, it is. Of the million of the million topics that they could, that's the one that they picked that they're in agreement on. It's it's kind of disappointing that they can't find agreement on other things. <laughs> yeah, definitely agree. So if we, if we go back to sort of where we started, we were talking about, uh, I guess, PAL, uh, you know, interest rates, what what we th- inflation, where we thought uh, that things could go, I guess, at least for this year. So what impact do you think, I guess, uh, no change in interest rates, at least for the next few months, will have, have on the markets? If we look at stock market today, CPI higher, didn't seem to worry. <laughs> it, it went up. We're, we're talking on the Tuesday the 12th. <laughs> So I guess what impact right. do you think this will have? Well, yeah, just to f- uh, feed off what you just said, we're recording the day that CPI came out. It came out a little bit hotter and the market doesn't care and it's going up. And why? Because as far as the stock market is concerned, Jay Paul said last week he's going to cut rates. Okay, don't even bo- we don't even need to bother with the data. He's going to cut rates because he said so. And that's really the mentality that we have in the market. Well, I might add, he's been saying it for a year. He's the same guy that said, uh, and he hasn't cut rates. He's also the same guy that said inflation was transitory. He was also the same guy that hinted about two times that he would stop hiking rates and he kept hiking rates. (laughs) So he says a lot of things he doesn't follow through on. And this is not necessarily a knock on him because, you know, the old Yogi Berra line predictions are hard, especially if they involve the future. You could say, I'm going to cut rates because I have a certain set of assumptions that certain things are going to happen. The inflation rate is going to go to 2%. The economy is going to look like it's going to be in a soft landing. And if that all happens, he will cut rates. But if that doesn't happen, he won't cut rates. So first of all, the market seems to be ignoring the data because he said he's going to cut rates. (laughs) Second of all, there's a bigger argument out there. Does it matter? I think it does. And I think it does for the following reason. I think what's happened with investing is The long run return of the stock market, if I buy stocks, the S&P 500, what should I reasonably expect it to do? 8% a year. That's its historical average. And based on a bunch of metrics, that's what you should, not 8% every year, but average 8% a year. Um, And uh, so if it's 2019 and I have a money market fund and it's yielding zero, People will scream, Tina, there is no alternative. What are you doing in that money market fund? You got to put your money in stocks. You got to put your money in more risk. You got to make more money. Get in stocks, get in stocks. Okay, makes perfect sense. But if it is 2024 and we continue with a 5.3% money market fund rate, and that's what it is, people looking around going, "Eh, it's 70% of the stock market's gains, 5.3 versus eight. And I get a $1 NAV every day, no risk. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, That's why a trillion and a half dollars has flowed into money market funds in the last 18 months. So, you know, people are trying to scream, Tina, oh, you got to get your money on the money market fund. And they're saying, no, I'll keep the majority of it here. But if I need to invest anything, I'll put 5%, you know, maybe I'll put 5% in an AI technology related uh, play and one or 2% in the Bitcoin ETF or some other hot sauce type of thing, no more than five, six, seven percent of my money, and the rest of it I will keep here. And that's why you're seeing such giant concentration in the stock market's gains. Um, if you look at the NASDAQ 100, which is the triple Q's uh, index, uh, it's up 8%, almost 9% for the year. Half those gains of that index is NVIDIA, one company. And if you add in uh, Meta, Microsoft, and Amazon, not only are they more than the gains of the index, that means the other 96 stocks collectively are at a loss for the year. A third of the gains in the S&P is is NVIDIA. That's why you get these concentrated gains. The money that comes into the market goes into the speculative areas. Uh, The bulk of the money is just staying right where it is. It's either in a bond fund, you're getting some yield, or it's in a money market fund getting 5.3. And if the Fed doesn't cut, that 5.3 is going to stick around. There's almost $7 trillion in money market funds. Now, if the Fed cuts, then the Tina crowd can start screaming, you can't stay in a money market fund. You're falling behind. You got to put your money in the stocks. And they might then start to move forward in that direction. But for right now, um, um, I think that when that reality comes, Fed's not going to cut rates and that that Tina arguments are going to work. 
the stock market is going to realize it's got a competition problem. It already does. That's why I think the other 96 stocks in the NASDAQ are not up on the year. If you look at the other 496 stocks in the S&P, in other words, not NVIDIA, Amazon, um, Meta, or, um, or um, Microsoft, they're only up 2% on the year. Now they're up and it's 2% and it's better than zero, but it's not the 6 or 7% gains that the entire index has. That's because of everything else that has been powering the index higher as well. So yeah, I think rates are going to matter. I just think that the market is looking at the CPI number going, the stock market going, it's all noise. He told me he's going to cut. But later on this year, if the reality comes in, there ain't going to be a cut. And you could scream and yell all you want, get in the stocks, get in the stocks. And you're telling people to buy fully valued stocks when they can get 70% of the stock market's expected gains in a money market fund. That competition, I think, is going to be problematic for the stock market later this year. Yeah, no, no, that, that makes sense. And as you mentioned before, uh, with with Powell, it seems like he's trying to hedge his bets and say, you know, he, uh, you know, if uh, data still remains high, you know, you know, he can say, oh, I wanted to cut. I, <laughs> you know, yeah. I said I wanted to cut, but the data's changed. It's just not there yet. All, all these. He's done uh, it before, things. and he's, yeah. you know, you know, he famously said in 2021, it's time we put that transitory word to rest. He just literally came out and said, that's just not working anymore. And there, there could be a point where he comes out and does that too. He sort of did that in, in January. In the January meeting, he kind of really disappointed everybody by saying there's going to be no cut. And then he followed it up in the United States by going on the news magazine show 60 Minutes on Sunday, three days after the Fed meeting, just to underscore where his thinking was on everything. And he could do that again if the data stays strong. He could absolutely come out and say, you can forget about the rate cuts. I'm sorry. The, or I'm happy to report that people are staying employed and the economy is staying strong. And the problem is sticky inflation. And I have to deal with that. Yeah. And what if he does cut? Do you think that would just be sort of uh, gasoline on the markets? That's the fear. That's the fear is that if he does cut, look, there's two times in history, in the history being the last 30 years, the Fed cuts for one of two reasons. They either panic because they see signs that the economy is falling apart. Obviously, we all remember 2020, and they panicked and they cut rates to zero real quickly. Or they try to cut as part of a victory lap. Hey, we accomplished our goals. Rates are, are don't need to be this high. They could come down. They did that twice, 1995 and in 2019. <clears throat> in both cases, risk markets, the S&P was up 37% in the following year after 1995. The S&P was going vertical after they cut rates in July of 2019, and animal spirits were raging in the, in the world until it hit the brick wall called COVID. And it was only because of COVID that it stopped. Otherwise, it might have still went going. So the Fed has to look and say, look, we cut rates and we, we jam up the stock market another 10 or 15 percent and home prices take off. If I'm right and there's a propensity to spend there's going to be a lot of people buying new cars and there's going to be a lot of people buying stuff and taking Italy trips and prices are going to go up even more. And then for the bottom 50% that don't own assets, that only have debt and see and see more inflation, they lose. So that's, I and I believe Jay Powell through his public pronouncements understands what I just said perfectly well and that's what's holding him back right now, that if you cut rates and you allow all the wealth managers in the world to scream at everybody, you got to get that $7 trillion out of money market funds and put it into something else. And we should jam everything higher and we produce more inflation. What have we done for the bottom 50 percent? We've made it worse for them. And that's the fear that you would have to have. So that's why I think he's going to be more deliberate about these rate cuts than people think. And why? He's waiting to see if there is a soft landing or if there is a last mile to 2% inflation. And I just tweeted out today, there is no last mile to 2% inflation. It bottomed to three, eight months ago, the inflate the over-year CPI inflation rate. And if it stays here, he's not going to cut. Might not be a bad thing, no 3% inflation, you know, interest rates quite high. It could be something that's actually good for for the economy 
moving forward, I guess, as you said, it would just be bad for people who, who have debt, especially if wages aren't rising. Right. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people in the top 50 percent that are getting a lot of interest income right now. There are a lot of companies. If you look at companies, um, the uh, the rise of interest rates has improved, improved their net financial position because companies are making more money on the revenues that they're generating from their cash, which weren't any a couple of years ago, then they are having to pay up in higher borrowing costs. They hedged out their borrowing costs two or three years ago. They saw these higher rates coming. So it's actually improving it for them. It's improving it for the upper half of the economy. Um, you know, So that'll keep GDP going. That'll keep the economy strong. The lower half is hurting. But what would really help them, because look, they don't have a portfolio. They don't own a home. They rent. So they can't, they can't benefit from rising assets. What they need is they need the inflation rate down. They need their boss to give them a 2 or 3% raise, and they need inflation at 1.5% to 2%. That's what they need. So they need the inflation rate down. So if keeping interest rates up is doing its part in trying to restrict the inflation rate, that would help them as well, too. Like I've argued, why do we need to cut rates? What is hurting that rates need to be cut? Office real estate, because some uh, uh, community banks are in trouble, that's not a problem of high interest rates. You can cut rates, that's not going to fix their problem. That's a problem of remote work. No one's going to the office. And people were too slow in recognizing this. And they're finally starting to mark down the value of a lot of that office real estate. And lower interest rates doesn't fix that problem. So what problem is there that lower interest rates would fix? About the only problem out there is real estate agents are crying, crying that mortgage rates are too high and they don't have enough closings to make enough fees uh, so that they can keep their paychecks solid. All right, true. But real estate agents alone are not going to get the Fed to move policy. It's going to take a lot more than that. Yeah, and that's in contrast to, I guess, the UK and, uh, and Australia and other markets where they're sort of variable uh, mortgages where I think there's a bit more pressure. I, I saw something recently, <laughs> I think, on the Financial Times where... Um, the uh, mortgages and arrears has sort of gone up to the highest level since 2016. So it, it seems to be having a bit of an impact. But as you said, the US has, has the benefit of uh, fixed mortgage, mortgages. Uh, so unless unemployment comes around, there's not really that that pressure to, to move. Right. And then to get a little technical on you, a lot of countries have what's called assignable mortgages. And what an assignable mortgage would be is if I have a 3.5% mortgage on my house and I go to sell my house, I could sell my mortgage to you as well. So you can assume the payments of that mortgage. So you not only, you know, you go through a credit check with the bank and you say, bank, I will buy the house. And the mortgage payments that were due here, instead of writing you a big check for the house, I'll just assume mm -hmm. those more, they'll take it over from me and continue to go forward. A lot of countries have that. And there's been some talk about whether or not the United States will adopt that. Now there's no chance it's gonna do it anytime soon. But that is a way that, you know, is insulated a lot of other countries from rapidly rising interest rates. Yeah, interesting. That's a really good point. So uh, how are you looking to position yourself, I guess, for the next six months or so? So I'm going to now um, update you and the audience listening. Um, I'm going to position myself because I have started an exchange traded fund, an ETF. It is a long only fixed income ETF. Uh, it is WT, Whiskey, Tango, Bianco, Nancy, WTBN. And uh, it is, like I said, it's long only. It is a fixed income total return index. BiancoAdvisors.com is the website to learn more about my ETF. So how am I positioned? I'm 90% my benchmark duration, which means that I am less sensitive to the rise of, to the movements of interest rates which means I am positioned that if interest rates go up, my fund will be hurt less by rising rates because I think rates are going to go up. I've recently moved it to 90% to do uh, the weighting in corporates. We were fully invested in corporates, but now with the big run-up in stocks, with the concentration, meaning that the bottom half of the companies are struggling and that's where they borrow, I think that at this point I would anticipate that we're near the end of the move in corporates, but I'm only 90%. I could go a lot shorter than that. So it's kind of a new position 
that uh, I, I've been at on corporates, I'm 80% mortgages uh, relative to my index, which is mortgages are option related securities. So they would they get underperform when the bond market's very volatile or the yield curve is inverted. And that's why we've been very short mortgages. But at 80%, we're moving up on those weightings with mortgages. Uh, and uh, that is because we still see more volatility in the bond market and we still see the curve staying inverted, less so than we were, say, three, four, five months ago. But so that's why we're moving more towards an equal weighting or an overweight. And then finally, we also have a 20% weighting in short-term tips, zero to five-year tips. So they're not very sensitive to interest rates. And if inflation stays sticky, they will throw off a higher interest income. All told, we are a long-only fund, and that's the way we're positioned. So I'm expecting a strong economy, higher rates. I'm expecting that the, the, the market is going to be bifurcated or very concentrated so that the bottom half companies, the industrial companies, the basic material companies, the energy companies that do a lot of borrowing may not do as well as the technology companies, but they don't borrow in the corporate bond market. Those other ones do. And that's why I think that I want to be more underweight that I think that the volatility in the mortgage market is going to be reduced. And that's why we're increasing our weighting, although underweight. And we've got this position in tips because I think inflation is going to stay sticky and that's going to prove to be a superior investment. And it has. And I will tell you, our fund is outperforming all of its benchmarks. It's doing better than if you were in a straight index fund. That's what we're trying to do is present, present an alternative to an index fund. But we're down in the year because we're fully invested, like every index in the bond market is. But I suspect before the end of the year, this rise in rates will be done and there will be a rally. And hopefully we will start it from a position of outperformance. So I'll answer the question how I'm going to perform, how I'm going to position by telling you exactly how I've positioned our own fund. Yeah, great. No, thank, thanks for running us through that. So, uh, Jim, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, what is the what is one message you like people to take away from our conversation? That the propensity to spend is real. That coming out of the COVID crisis, the attitudes changed, and if people are spending money, it's going to be hard to get a soft landing or a recession, and or sticky inf or inflation to get down to two percent. Now, eventually that will change. We'll have a recession or another financial crisis. I'm not saying it will be anytime soon. It might be in 10 years. It might be next month. But then that will change. But for right now, things are much stronger than people think. And that's going to be problematic on the inflation front. Great, great message. So yeah, th thanks again for your time. So if anyone wanted to find out more about your work, I know you just mentioned the ETF. Where else would they be able to? Uh, so research-wise, BiancoResearch.com is where I, I'm active on Twitter, Bianco Research. I'm very active on YouTube. Uh, those are the two social media platforms. Jim Bianco, my name, I'm active on LinkedIn. Less so, but I'm still there um, as well too. BiancoResearch.com is the research side of our business. BiancoAdvisors.com is our ETF. And it's WTBN is our ETF if you want to learn more about it. Thank you. No problem. Perfect. I'll put that in the description below, but thanks again for your time. Thank you.